And I believe that all too often, underlying power dynamics are at the heart of our violence challenges and that the social media and digital landscape that we have in our world today, while hugely beneficial in so many respects, if not regulated, will be and is being used by those in positions of power and those who aspire to positions of power to do great harm. Geneva Peacecast, a series on solutions from Geneva Peace Week, produced by Interpeace and Fondation Hirondelle. Urban spaces can quickly become pressure cookers for tension and violence, and even more so when a crisis such as the coronavirus pandemic adds a new layer of challenge and stress. Hello, I'm Jackie Dalton, and joining me is Rachel Locke, the Director of Impact Peace at the Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice at San Diego University. We'll be talking about research into urban violence, online spaces, and the coronavirus. Thank you very much for being here, Rachel. Um, the past year or so has probably been a fascinating time to study the role of the digital world, and in particular, its interplay with the pandemic. And I imagine you found yourself very quickly immersed into this work. Hi, yeah, I, I did as um, many others in the violence prevention space, I think did as well. Um, you know, when, when COVID-19 sort of became, uh, when it became clear just how pervasive and, and insidious COVID-19 was as a virus uh, in, let's say, February, March, April of 2020, I think those of us in the violence prevention space sort of scrambled to figure out what the implications were going to be. We know that um, previous uh, epidemics certainly had pretty clear connections to, to violence prevention and violence dynamics overall. I have this very stark memory in the very beginning of the pandemic. I think it was late March or early April, when my partner had a um, had to take a, a car because his car had broken down. And so he had to bring it to the shop and had to get a, an Uber uh, to return to his home. And as he was sitting in the, he's very polite, <laughs> as he was sitting in the, the back of the Uber, um, he was listening to the driver who was going on and on about how COVID-19 was um, a man-made creation uh, facilitated by George Soros and other global elite uh, as part of a, a kind of global network and ring to further entrench their wealth, um, to, to reinforce this child uh, pornography ring that they had um, and to insert uh, trackers through an eventual quote unquote vaccine that they would come up to insert trackers to, to control humanity. And um, so my partner got home from this very uh, <laughs> illuminating, if you will, car ride and called me and told me about the story. And we laughed at the time. And I thought, where, where did that come from, right? I mean, this was, again, very early. And within days, this kind of conspiracy theory laden um, rhetoric was all over the place. And I very quickly came to realize, as did many others, just how tightly connected what this Uber driver was talking about was to a whole host of political rhetoric um, that was using the online space in order to foment fear, in order to take advantage of a crisis, to reinforce uh, biases, prejudices, um, and hate, really, using the online space. So um, there was this you know, this, this moment very quickly went from one of uh, kind of levity to one of, oh my, oh my word, oh my goodness, um, this, this, the spread, this of fear and, and hate online connected to 
decades, centuries old biases um, and, and a reinforcement of um, power by an elite is happening it, in real time before our eyes. And we better get on this and we better start looking at this and we better start tracking this. And it seems increasingly likely that there's a direct link between uh, COVID-19 um, and misinformation and violence in urban areas. What evidence is out there about the pandemic increasing violence? And what do we know about why this is happening? Yeah, so I mean, first, I think it's important to break down different types of violence and the implications that we saw across different types of violence. So, you know, connected directly back to what I was just saying, we definitely saw an increase in um, the sort of racist and prejudicial blaming of people, uh, for, of certain categories of people for being responsible for the virus, for spreading the virus. Um, now, we also saw a pretty immediate and very alarming uptick in violence against women uh, and violence within the home. So that would also include violence against children and elder abuse. Um, in some places, so in the in the earliest months of the pandemic, we saw spikes ranging from 10 to 70 percent of increases um, in, in violence against women. In large part, this is because the already insufficient safety net was pretty immediately um, uh, swept out from under women um, as people were forced to, to stay home as lockdown orders kind of spread across the globe. And then we saw um, uh, uh, implications in terms of what, what people would group as sort of community or group or gang-based violence. Um, that varied quite considerably uh, around the world. And in the, in the earliest months of the pandemic, this actually went down in many places um, as there were there was less interaction between groups. There were fewer opportunity um, moments because people were at home. Um, but actually what has proven to be true in many, many places is that there's been a kind of since the start of the pandemic to now a reversion to the mean. Now in some countries, including my own in the US, uh, what we have seen is uh, pretty remarkable and very concerning spikes in urban violence in 2020 and 2021. Uh, and again, many hypotheses for why, um, but that there have been pretty massive increases in homicide rates, for example, um, in many of our urban centers. And the research you've been doing is part of something called the Peace in Our Cities Network. Could you tell us a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so just uh, in September of 2019, so uh, six months before the pandemic started, um, we launched this uh, very ambitious, what started as campaign and has transitioned into a network, um, but campaign called Peace in Our Cities, which was formed with this idea that we have um, a massive problem of violence in our urban areas, that violence outside of conflict constitutes the vast majority of lethal violence in the world today. Um, but in fact, the majority of investment in, in education, in exchange of ideas and tools and good practice tilts towards conflict type violence, um, even though four out of five people who die violently do so outside of conflict zones. So we have this massive problem that receives woefully insufficient attention. And yet we also have a wide range of um, effective practice of tools of um, individuals and experts who are, uh, who have helped cities to reduce their violence levels um, by 
you know, 20 to 50% and that that knowledge is going to waste. So while we have a huge problem and we have a huge reserve of knowledge to address the problem. So let's talk a bit more about some of these tools and best practices. What are you seeing that seems to be working well? Um, so there's been a lot of really interesting innovation that has uh, taken place pre-pandemic, but really there was a surge um, of understanding the benefits of kind of the digital space and social media in particular during COVID-19. So we saw, for example, a shift to um, uh, democratic participation and inclusive discussions um, in, from in-person to an online space. So city hall type meetings shifted to an online space, which in some places made, meant that they could be more inclusive, more accessible to people who previously weren't able to, to come. Um, we saw the use of social media, not only to track the supplies, uh, so PPE, uh, food delivery, um, other support that was being provided as a result of COVID-19, but also the use of so social media to um, prevent government or um, individual <laughs> government agents from um, benefiting from COVID-19 uh, resource distribution. So um, uh, anti-corruption efforts were um, motivated and, and moved to the online space with some degree of effectiveness. There have also been um, efforts to track and to analyze um, things like increasing polarization within society, um, uh, the chain of um, xenophobic rhetoric, the pathways that that takes. Um, there have been efforts to, to track that, to document that, and to use that information um, to regulate that in places around the world, um, as has there also been uh, efforts to use social media and to use the online space to track uh, the very real uh, harms that come to, for example, women in the public space. So this, this predates the pandemic, but things like the Safe City app in India, which is a crowd crowdsourcing type app where people can document parts of the city that are less safe for women than other parts of the city, which can then help to inform um, urban investments and things like improved lighting and changes to transportation modalities, but also um, can shift the way that the security actors, police and others um, interact with members of the community to, to try to prevent um, violence towards women. So uh, now, of course, and here, go, here I go into the negative, that's the flip side of this as well, is that all of that can be used for um, negative uh, and malicious purposes as well, right? So that sort of ease of engaging people can also be used to manipulate um, both the individuals who are engaging and also the political powers that be. And finally, Rachel, um, what would be your top three recommendations for those who are looking to harness digital technology to create more peaceful urban environments? What do you suggest they prioritize? So at the at the very top, I think we have to acknowledge that um, half of the world has no access to internet technology at all, right? So one of the things that was articulated over and over again was that the pandemic didn't necessarily create inequalities, it reinforced existing inequalities. So there have been studies that show that um, in parts of a country and parts of a city that had less um, uh, internet connectivity, that those were areas that had higher death rates 
from COVID-19 because people didn't have access to, to information for how to protect themselves. So at the very top level, we have to, we have to sort of place inequality in the way in which um, all of the benefits that I just spoke about that comes from technology, social media, the digital space is lost for a full one half of our world's population. And so addressing that um, is top recommendation. The second recommendation is just a real need for increased digital literacy. Um, we see all over the world people understanding and taking in information or um, words, I should say. It's hard to even say information in some instances. Uh, taking that in as fact, as news. Um, and that what they are in fact taking in is uh, conspiracy, is rumor, is manipulated prejudice towards a very particular and often very violent end. Um, the, the technology that we have at our fingertips today is massively influential and massively misunderstood and underappreciated. And then the third one uh, is along the same theme, which is regulation. So the, the media giants here, which, um, you know, predominantly would include face, excuse me, Facebook and Twitter, it certainly wouldn't be only those two, are woefully inadequately regulated. The technology is far outpacing our uh, our kind of ability to understand how to use the technology and our ability to understand how best to regulate the technology. Um, and the consequences of that are potentially massively destabilizing. And of course, pre-pandemic and during the pandemic, we saw the use of this online, these online spaces um, to foment violence that had very real and and large destructive and lethal effect, uh, whether that's in Myanmar or other, or India, um, where rumors spread like wildfires and resulted in very real world um, uh, negative and awful and, and violent consequences. So our regulators have to get on this with uh, immediacy and that um, will be mainly at the national level, but our city leadership and of course, urban constituents who are perhaps the most powerful um, have to demand that our, that our leaders at the national level get on this. This is an all hands on deck kind of situation. Um, so looking at inequalities, addressing digital lit literacy and getting on top of our regulatory environment, I would say are the the big three here. Thanks. I'm Jackie Dalton of Formation Hondel. I've been talking to Rachel Locke, Director of Impact Peace at the Croc Institute for Peace and Justice. Rachel, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It was nice talking to you. Geneva Peacecast, produced by Interpeace and Fondation Hirondelle.